Hello again. In our last video, we talked about specialized language and what that means. In this installment of the series, we'll be talking about discourse genres. Discourse refers to spoken or written communication. A genre is a type or category of art, music, writing, or speech. When we use the term discourse genre in a university context, we're referring to a specific type of written or spoken communication, such as an academic presentation or a laboratory report. You could say, then, that a discourse genre is a type of text, usually, although not exclusively, a written one. Discourse genres usually use specialized language, and they often have quite fixed characteristics. Sometimes, these types of texts are common to a range of academic disciplines, with only slight differences depending on the subject area. That would be the case with scientific articles. Some discourse genres are shared by many disciplines, but tend to be more frequent in certain ambits than in others. For instance, in philology, posters are more common in linguistics than in literature. Other discourse genres are shared by some disciplines, but are never used in others. Patient records may be common to the health sciences, medicine, nursing, veterinary medicine, but they are not found in other areas. Finally, there are highly specific discourse genres that basically belong only to one particular discipline. For example, ethnographies and anthropology. So, what determines the specific characteristics of a discourse genre? Well, in addition to cultural and linguistic factors, discourse genres can be shaped and controlled by different institutions and organizations. For instance, the academic articles that you're going to encounter in your university studies in the experimental sciences, the health sciences, law, the humanities, and so on, conform to norms and expectations that have been established uh, over many years by the academic world in general. However, they also meet the specific requirements of each discipline. Sometimes these expectations are flexible, other times they can be quite strict. For instance, the structure of a scientific article is usually far more rigid than the structure of one in the humanities. Other discourse genre characteristics can be established by regulations, such as those that aim to provide students with uh, standards for producing work. Uh, these might be established by the university, the faculty, or a department. Uh, examples of this would be a degree final project or a master's thesis, which have to be written in accordance with specific guidelines and rules. Outside of academia, some professional contexts use discourses that are almost entirely inflexible. Think about contracts in law or patient information leaflets for medicines in pharmacology. So, at university and then later in the professional world, there are many distinct types of discourse genres. Students need to know how to use the particular ones that will allow them to discuss, debate, and contribute to knowledge in accordance with the traditions and practices of their chosen discipline. Knowing how to do this effectively is one way to indicate that you are a member of what is called a community of practice or community of discourse. These communities identify people as competent members of a group, whether academic, medical, legal, scientific, or professional. If you are not an effective user of the discourse genres for your specific discipline, that is, if you are not both an effective consumer and producer of those genres, and if your academic language does, is not in line with what, is, uh, with what is expected in your discipline, it will almost certainly affect your ability to participate fully in it. Let's look at an example. Imagine you're in a lecture on dental anatomy. The following description is the type of language we would expect as a sample of the discourse genre in that context. Independently of tooth type, molar, canine, etc., all teeth have two anatomical parts. The first of these is known as the crown, which is the part of a tooth that has an enamel covering. Especially in adults, it is generally visible within the mouth. The second part is a root, which is the part of the tooth that is embedded in the jaw. It anchors the tooth into its osseous socket and is normally not visible. Now imagine that you're in that same dental anatomy class, but the lecturer decides to provide the following description instead. Students might understandably feel that the discourse wasn't appropriate. So, yeah, I mean, 
There's basically two bits to any tooth, uh, whether we're talking about the ones you use for chewing, those Dracula fangs at the side of your mouth, those big beaver-like chompers we use for cutting right up here at the front. We've got the top bit, which can be pearly white or scuzzy brown, depending on how often you brush. And then this gnarly root that goes right down into your jawbone. <laughs> Thank God you can't usually see that. Am I right? The first text is in keeping with the discourse genre requirements for that particular context, a lecture in a faculty of dental medicine. The second is not. And while they convey the same information, the effect is distinct. The first text underscores the professional nature of the speaker. The second text is too informal and could lead people to, to draw negative conclusions regarding the speaker's competence and ability. In the same way then, if you are asked by your teacher for a class assignment, let's say, to give an oral or written presentation on a specific topic in your field, you will have to do it in line with the conventions and expectations of your specific discipline. That may well include providing detailed references and sources and justified explanations, sometimes quite technical ones. But of course, no one expects you to know all about discourse genres when you first begin your university studies. That is something you will need to learn about carefully by focusing on the type of language used in your specific discipline, by modeling your writing after the literature you are asked to read, and by paying close attention to the language your teacher uses when discussing academic topics.